Good evening, and thank you for attending our program on the secret World War II diary, concentration camp diary of Art Nansen. Our presenter is Timothy Boyce. This presentation is sponsored by the Friends of the Hamden Library and offered in connection with the International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which is commemorated on January 27th. My name is Elisabeth Angele. I am responsible for information and patron services at the Hamden Public Library. Before I introduce you to our presenter this evening, I would like to do some Zoom keeping. Please note that we will record this program. I will send out a follow-up email with the recording link tomorrow. We also plan to upload the recording to the Hampton Public Library's YouTube channel. To achieve the best sound quality, everyone should be muted. When you want to participate in the discussion, please unmute yourself. Oh, how do I do that? You, there are different ways to do that on the microphone icon on the left-hand side of the Zoom toolbar. Simply click on that or hold down the space bar on your computer or hold down the Alt key and the letter A. Once you have finished sharing your thoughts, please mute yourself again. And we will have no. a question and answer session at the end of Mr. Boyce's presentation. That's For information sure. on future library mm -hmm. programs, please okay. go to our library website, hamdenlibrary.org. Click on programs on our website. You can also sign up to obtain our weekly digital library newsletter via okay. scroll down to updates. That's where you can sign up. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our presenter this evening, Timothy Boyce. Mr. Boyce, a Connecticut native, practiced law for many years, most recently serving as the managing partner of the Charlotte, North Carolina office of Detchard LLP, an international law firm. He holds an MBA from the Wharton School of Finance and a JD from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. He received a BS from Georgetown University. His articles have appeared in the Quarterly Journal of Military History, World War II Magazine, the Scandinavian Review and Viking Magazine. Okay, what did I do? Mr. Boyce currently lives in Tryon, North Carolina. He retired in 2014 to devote himself full time to writing and speaking. Thank you for presenting this evening, Mr. Boyce. Well, thank you for that introduction, Elizabeth. I'll take it from here. And again, it's my honor to be speaking to you in commemoration for the International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which is this Saturday, the 27th, which is the anniversary of the liberation of uh, Auschwitz. And as Elizabeth mentioned, I'm speaking to you from Western North Carolina. I'm in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains closest city that you may know of is uh, Asheville, uh, North Carolina. But I am a Connecticut native. I was born in New Haven, St. Raphael's Hospital, and was raised in East Haven and went to 
high school in West Haven at Notre Dame. So I, our team played the uh, Hamden in football at every Thanksgiving. So I was at the Hamden uh, high school uh, for the green bowl for many, many, many years. So it's nice to have kind of a homecoming. What I'm going to be talking to you about today, this evening, is a gentleman you probably never have heard of before, a Norwegian named Odd Nansen, and a diary that he kept while he was a prisoner for three and a half years in different German concentration camps during World War II that he published after the war under the title From Day to Day, From Dog Till Dog. Here's a picture of what the book looks like now. What I'd like to do is begin by telling you a story. And I'd like you to not just simply listen to the story, I'd like you to almost try to project yourself into the story as if I'm relating a story about you and your experiences. Now that's gonna require you to use some of your imagination. So first of all, I'd like you all to try to imagine that you were once again a 10 year old child. Second of all, I'd like you to imagine that instead of the date being January 23rd, 2024, Imagine the date is January 23rd, 1945. And third, and most importantly, I'd like you to imagine that instead of waking up in a nice cozy bed in a nice house in Hamden, Connecticut, that you find yourself waking up in a barracks in a concentration camp called Auschwitz. And the guards have just come into your barracks and they're screaming and shouting and bellowing the command, Rouse, Rouse. Those of you who know some German know that Raus means out. Everybody out. We're evacuating the whole camp. So you line up outside your barracks. You join this marching column that is already miles long. You make your way through the front gate onto these back roads. And you march for the next three days through the ice and snow and mud and slush in bitterly cold temperatures as only Eastern Europe can be like probably not that different from the temperatures I think you were experiencing and that we were experiencing here in North Carolina just a few days ago where the lows were down in the teens. That would be typical of January in um, the uh, Auschwitz area in 1945. Then after marching for three days, you reach a rail junction, at which point you're put on a train. But this is a train that consists exclusively of cattle cars. Now, cattle cars have four sides, but they have no roof, they have no heat, they have no plumbing, they have no protection from the elements. And you're gonna spend the next 10 days in that cattle car as this train slowly makes its way out of southwestern Poland, takes a long southerly detour through Czechoslovakia, and then turns north into Germany and finally comes to a stop about 25 miles north of Berlin at yet another concentration camp, this one called Sachsenhausen. And when you get to Sachsenhausen, you're grateful that you're still even alive. Thousands of people died in just that two-week period in what became known in history as the Auschwitz death marches. In fact, one out of every four prisoners who left Auschwitz in late January 1945 did not reach their destination alive. But as I say, you've made it. You've arrived in Sachsenhausen. You're one of the lucky ones. That doesn't mean that you're not suffering by this point. It doesn't mean that you're not hurting. In fact, by the time you get to Sachsenhausen, you can barely walk into the camp under your own power. You've got terrific pains in both of your feet. But up until now on this two week odyssey that you've been on, you dare not take off your boots to see what's wrong with your feet, to see what the source of this pain is. Probably for a variety of reasons, but certainly one of the main reasons is your fear that if you take off your boots, Somebody is going to steal them from you. Remember, you're only a 10-year-old child at this point. And people are prepared in January 1945 to do just about anything to try to stay alive. But now that you're in Sachsenhausen, you finally have a chance to take a look at your feet to see what the source of this growing pain is. And you see that your feet no longer look like the palm of my hand. They're no longer flesh-colored. Your feet, in fact, have turned completely black black from a severe case of frostbite. In fact, so severe that the flesh on your toes is already beginning to rot. So you know you have to get some medical attention. You know you have to go to the infirmary. The German word for the infirmary is the Revier. I mean, that after all sounds logical, right? When you and I get sick, or get injured, 
we get medical attention. A year ago at this time, I came down with the RSV virus. I ended up having to go into the emergency room and getting some medications and some help that way to turn the corner. But in the crazy upside down world of a concentration camp, the prisoners actually considered going to the infirmary, to the Revier, to be one of the most dangerous things you could do. They call, the prisoners called the Revier the waiting room for the gas chamber. Because if you think about it, if you're lying in a hospital bed, by definition, you're not working. And if you're not working, you're not producing for the, and contributing to the camp, why should the camp authorities waste any resources on you? If you die, another nameless prisoner is just going to take your place anyways. You're completely fungible. But you also know that if you don't get any medical attention, assuming you can even put up with this pain that keeps growing in your feet, you're probably going to either get gangrene or sepsis, either one of which is going to end up killing you. So you screw up your courage, you report to the infirmary. Luckily for you that day, there's not a Nazi doctor on duty. It was a fellow prisoner, a kindly doctor. He takes one look at your feet. He asks you to jump up on an examining table so he can look at him a little bit more closely. With that, he gives a sign to a couple of orderlies. They come, come along beside you, suddenly hold down your arms. They hold down your legs. And the doctor gives you a whiff of ether to knock you unconscious. The next thing you realize is you're slowly waking up, coming back to consciousness. You look around and you see that you're now lying in a hospital bed in the infirmary. You look down at your feet. You see that they're now heavily bandaged. And the orderlies in that hospital ward explain to you that the doctor had to amputate some of your toes in order to save your feet from further infection. So here you are lying in a bed wondering to yourself, you know, how long am I going to be able to use a hospital bed? I'm a 10-year-old child. What happens if a Nazi doctor walks in and sees me like this? You know, what are my chances then? In the meantime, hundreds, if not thousands of prisoners are streaming through the infirmary at all hours of the day and night. By the spring of 1945, Sachsenhausen had a prisoner population somewhere in the vicinity of about 40 thousand prisoners. It was the size of a, of a large town. In fact, Sachsenhausen was the second largest concentration camp in the German system, second only to Auschwitz, which we've heard much more about. And all these prisoners who are coming through the infirmary have one thing in common, which is they're not paying the slightest attention to you. I mean, after all, they don't know who you are. You're not a member of their extended family. You're not from their village in Europe. So why should they care about you? The most important thing for everybody is to look out for themselves, not to worry about strangers. And then one day, a middle-aged man comes in. He's coming in to visit one of his friends, who is also sick. And instead of walking right by you and ignoring you like everybody else has up to that point, he stops and he starts talking to you. He asks you questions. Child, what's your name? Where did you come from? What camps were you in before you got to Sachsenhausen? Do you know where your parents are anymore? Do you have any friends? Do you know anybody at all in this camp? In other words, this one individual is showing some interest in you and in your plight. Now, why am I telling you this elaborate story in the first place? Well, number one, that's an absolutely true story. The young child that I've just been describing was a boy named Thomas Bergenthal. Here's a picture of Tommy taken in 1938. He's all of four years old in that photograph. And he would be taken prisoner by the Nazis in the late uh, fall of 1939, the very beginning of World War II, and remain a prisoner along with his mother and father in different concentration camps for no other crime other than the fact that he was Jewish. Now, the person who stopped to talk to him was a man named Ad Nansen, a Norwegian. Now, the second reason why I'm telling you this story is that that chance meeting between these two people in this very large camp ended up changing both of their lives. Now, I've already told you how large Sachsenhausen was, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of prisoners. In fact, it was so large it had not one but four infirmaries, Revier 1, 2, 3, and 4. And it just so happened that Tommy was put in Revier number 3 to recuperate. And that's where, where Odd Nonsense Friend was recuperating as well. If Tommy had been put in Revier 1 or 2 or 4, these two people probably never would have run into each other at all. But as I say, that chance meeting changed both their lives. 
In fact, in Tommy's case, it literally meant the difference between life and death, between living and dying. Because from that day forward, Nansen used his food and tobacco rations to bribe the orderlies to look out for Tommy, to make sure that he did not show up on a selection list going off to the gas chamber, which were periodically being put together to, quote unquote, make room for more prisoners. Now, some of you may be thinking quite naturally, how could Nansen be giving away food and tobacco rations that he had to save this young boy while, while he was in a concentration camp? How, how, how could he survive? I thought everybody in these camps was on the edge of starvation. All these pictures we see of prisoners in these camps are all these skeletal uh, remains. But that's not a complete and accurate picture of what life in these large concentration camps was like. And there are very highly stratified societies on the basis of race. And that was because the Nazis were obsessed with this concept of race. They thought race explained really how the world worked. And they in turn took race as kind of their guidepost on how they would treat the world. And in what the Nazis called their Weltanschauung, which means their worldview, of course, the Nazis believed that they belonged to the Aryan race, and the Aryan race were the head and Volk, the master race, the race that was destined to rule this new world order that they were creating and conquered Europe. The bottom of the totem pole, where the Nazis put the Jews, who they considered to be untermenschen, subhuman, fit for nothing other than ultimate extermination. But the Nazis had to find a place in this pecking order for all the other quote unquote races, we would call them nationalities, but they, they believed each nationality had its own racial, unique racial characteristics. And the Nazis looked at the Scandinavian prisoners, both the Norwegians and the Danish prisoners. And they said, in many ways, you are racially akin to us. You're almost like our first cousins, racially speaking. I mean, after all, you're tall, blonde haired, blue eyed, you could almost pass for Aryan, but you're not Germanic, so you can't be Aryan, but we'll put you Nordic races, the you uh, Danish and, and uh, Norwegian prisoners, pretty much just one notch below us. And we think you're racially superior, certainly to the French, the Greeks, the Poles, and by virtue of the fact that the Germans held the Scandinavians in, in relatively high regard, even though they were prisoners in a concentration camp, they allowed them one benefit that they didn't allow to anybody else in these concentration camps. And that is they allowed them to receive food parcels in the Red Cross. And if you're receiving food in a camp where everybody else literally is on the edge of starvation, then you're rich. You can get anything you want. You can barter away your food for anything you need. One of the first questions that's often asked to me is, how could Ad Nansen have kept a diary? How did he get his hands on a paper and pencil? Believe me, if you're getting packages of cheese, sardines, sausage, herring, you can trade that for anything you want. The level of corruption in these camps was astonishing. There was nothing you could not obtain if you had the right currency. And that currency was food. So Nansen had the wherewithal to help Tommy just by virtue of the fact that he was Norwegian and was getting food parcels. Now, I mentioned a few minutes ago that this chance meeting changed both their lives. When you think about it, what can a young 10-year-old Jewish boy who's just had some of his toes amputated, what can he possibly do to help a middle-aged man like Odd Nansen, who is in relatively good health because he's getting these food parcels? Well, there's nothing probably physically that a young boy can do to help a grown man like Nansen. But I think there is a psychological component to this. And I think as you read Nansen's diary, by the time you get to the spring of 1945, which is when the two of them end up meeting, I think you gotta, you've got to come to the conclusion that Nansen was heading for a mental breakdown. The, the text and the tone of his diary entries are, are much more distressed than they've ever been. But this time he's been in different concentration camps for over three years. He's seen every kind of cruelty, every kind of barbarity imaginable. And every time he thinks things can't get any worse, of course, they would always get even worse. And so I think meeting Tommy changed something psychologically in him. And let me read to you something that Nansen wrote after the war. This isn't in his diary, but it's um, something that I think um, expresses the, um, 
the thoughts and the, and the impact that Tom Bergenthal had on Odd Nonsense. And he wrote, everywhere I went in the camp, Tom's angelic face popped up. Without suspecting it, Tommy accomplished with us a work of salvation. He touched something in us which was about to disappear. He called to life again human feelings, which were painful to have, but which nevertheless meant salvation for us all. So I think getting involved with Tommy and trying to save him as, save his life, trying to keep him alive, gave Nansen a purpose, a goal that he could kind of take, get himself out of this mental tailspin that he was going through. Now, the third reason why I'm telling this story is that that chance meeting between these two people ended up changing my life as well. Now, I think you can tell I'm not old enough to have even been allowed, been around during World War II. And it would take about 60 years, 60, or more than 60 years for that event to intersect with my life and change it forever. And I guess I have to confess to you, first of all, I'm speaking to you from my library. And you can see I've got a big library. I've got books on all these different walls all over the place, about 5,000 books here. And almost every one of these books, certainly all the books behind me, are all history books. I'm just fascinated with history. To me, history is the study of human nature. And in the back in 2010, so we're going back 14 years ago now, I went into a bookstore in Charlotte, North Carolina, because that's where I was living and, and working, as Elizabeth mentioned. To, and I always, when I went to the history books, to the bookstore, I always went right to the history section. I buy books faster than I can read them, quite frankly. I'm a book collector as well as a book reader. And I went to the history section and I came across this newly published book, a book called The Lucky Child, written by somebody named Thomas Bergenthal. Brand new book, had never seen it before, didn't know anything about it, had never heard of it. But when I saw that cover and I saw that subtitle, A Memoir of Surviving Auschwitz as a Young Boy, that's what caught my eye. And I thought, any book about anybody surviving in Auschwitz has got to be an incredible story. How a child could possibly have survived, it's got to be doubly interesting. And of course, that picture you see on the cover, that's a picture of Tom Bergenthal taken shortly after he's been liberated in the spring of 1945. He looks a little bit more uh, grown up, a little bit more serious than in that earlier picture that I showed to you. So I bought this book on nothing but an impulse, took it home, started reading it, and I learned the story that I've just related to you this evening about how Tom ends up in Auschwitz, takes part in the evacuation. He arrives in Sachsenhausen with frostbitten feet, has some of his toes amputated, meets Nansen. Nansen intervenes and saves his life by bribing the orderlies. And at that point in Tom Bergenthal's memoir, he says, you know, this, this uh, Nansen fellow, man who saved my life, he kept a diary while he was a prisoner. And then Tom adds a short note on the bottom of page 177. I think you can all read that on your screens. It's nothing more than a description of this diary that he's mentioned in the text. It talks about how it was published, of course, in Norway, then translated into English and published in America in 1949. Well, I'm an attorney by profession, so I've almost kind of got it in my DNA to always read the fine print, always read footnotes. So when I read this footnote, I made a mental note about this diary. I'd never heard of it. I had never heard of Odd Nansen. In fact, at that point in 2010, I probably couldn't have told you anything about what Norway did during World War II. But I thought maybe this diary would be an interesting book to read as well. I'm always looking for, for good reads. And if nothing else, I'd be curious to see what Nansen says about Tom Bergenthal, since I know what Tom Bergenthal says about Odd Nansen. Now, of course, this book, having been published back in 1949, you're not going to walk into your local Barnes & Noble and find it on the shelf, where do you have to go? You have to go looking on the internet. You know, if people are selling anything in this today's world, of course, they're advertising it on the internet. And a lot of the books that you see behind me are out of print books that I went on the internet to find from booksellers all around the world. So I do a search for this diary from day to day, and I'm able to locate one single copy of this diary for sale anywhere in the entire United States in the year 2010. It was in a bookseller in the state of Washington. Now I could find two more copies for sale in Great Britain, one in Australia, one in New Zealand. That makes five for the entire world that I could find. I mean, I think there's more copies of 
the Gutenberg Bible for sale on the internet, and there were copies of this book. Where all the other copies have disappeared to, I'm sure they're in some people's private libraries, even some public libraries around the world. But in terms of actually buying a, this book, there was only five booksellers who are offering it in 2010. So I bought one of those books. I bought it actually from the bookseller in New Zealand because it was in the best condition. And when it finally arrived in the mail, I'd opened the box that held it. And I thought, wow, th th this is one heck of a diary. It's well over 500 pages. So this is, this is going to take me a while. And in fact, I was already in the middle of reading a big history book. So I thought to myself, well, one way to kind of attack this is just to read a simple diary entry every night. I'll be reading it almost as he's writing it, kind of walking in his footsteps. And I did that for about a week or 10 days. And then one night when I was getting into bed due to start reading, which is when I usually did my pleasure reading before I turned off the lights, I thought to myself, you know, this fellow was in prison for three and a half years. At the rate I'm going, this is going to take me three and a half years to get to the end of this book. So that's an awful long period of time to wait to find out how this whole thing ends. But I can, I can kind of speed up my reading process just by starting to read two diary entries every night. So I started reading two. And after another week or so went by, I read my two diary entries and something was about to happen in the diary. I can't remember exactly what it was. Nansen was either going to get in trouble for something or his wife was going to come visit him. And I thought to myself, well, I can't really, I can't stop tonight. I've got to read the next diary entry to see how everything turns out. So why don't I start reading three diary entries? And you can see the, the slippery slope that I was beginning to slide down. I got to the point very shortly thereafter where I took the other history book that I was reading, which was not nearly as interesting, put it back on the shelf, and I just started reading this thing straight through. I mean, I, by this time, I was smitten by this book. I couldn't think about anything else but reading this book. I'd carry it with me everywhere I went. I'd, e I'd even bring it into work with me. And uh, in the morning, I'd say to my secretary, I'd say, listen, Linda, I'm working on a really, really important loan agreement, and I need total concentration this morning. I don't want any phone calls. I don't want any visitors. Just basically leave me alone while I'm drafting. And of course, what I would then do is go into my office, close the uh, my office door, put my feet up on my desk, take out this book out of my briefcase and start reading it. And before I'd even gotten to the end of it, before I even finished this whole book, this thought kept going through my mind. How can it be that no one else has seen fit in the last 61 years to get this book back into print? This book is to me, it's a masterpiece. It's better than every single book, history book I've got on this bookshelf behind me. And I don't know why no one else did this, but if you think about it, if there's only five copies of this book for sale in the world, the chances statistically of anybody even stumbling upon it the way I stumbled upon it and then doing anything about it is pretty darn small. With my one purchase, I've already cornered 20% of the market. Now there's only four copies available for sale on the internet. So I made up my mind, you know what? Damn it. I'm going to get this book back in print. It's just too darn good. I, I, want, I want people to read this book. And the only way to get them to read it is to produce it so that it's available. And I made another key decision back in 2010 when I decided initially to get this book back into print. And that was by this time I had been so obsessed with this book that I was spending all my free time doing research on who Ram Nansen was and what Norway did during the war and how concentration camps were operated. There was stratified society. I didn't know any of that stuff. And as I learned all this, I thought, well, gosh, if I had only known all this when I first read this diary, everything in it would have made even more sense to me. So why don't I become the editor of this diary and annotate it, write an introduction, write footnotes explaining who Nansen is talking about, the people, the places, the events he mentions in his diary. So you can ignore everything I've added to this diary and just read his words, which is how I read it, and I think you'll enjoy it. But if you want to know more, I've, uh, I've added it. So after six years of research and six years of re a lot of rejection letters, I uh, made a presentation and was introduced to the director of the uh, Vanderbilt University Press. And in 2016, they published the new fully annotated a uh, deluxe edition of this diary, the picture of which I showed you in an earlier slide. So what I'd like to do with all of you tonight is give you some of the basics, the who, what, why, where, when of this man and this diary. And hopefully, if nothing else, you come away with 
an appreciation for just what a remarkable man Ahn Nansen was. To me, he's one of these unsung heroes of World War II. Let's get started. Who was Ahn Nansen? Well, here's a photograph of the Nansen family. That photograph is taken in the spring of 1902. Since Ahn Nansen was born in December of 1901, you can pretty easily figure out that he's the young baby in his mother's arms in that photograph. You can also tell from that that he is the fourth child born to his parents. His mother's name was Eva Nansen, and his father's name was Fritjof Nansen. Both of his parents came from very well-to-do families in Norway. They were uh, very prominent families. Both of his par parents were very accomplished. They were both very artistic. His mother was both a concert singer and an artist, and his father was an equally good artist. And Nansen uh, inherited that artistic gene, as we're going to see. He's quite a talented artist himself. Unfortunately for, for Nansen, his mother died when he was only six years old. She died of pneumonia in December of 1907, leaving him to be raised pretty much single-handedly by his father, Fritjof Nansen. And that was both a blessing and a curse, because although the name Fritjof Nansen means virtually nothing to us Americans, in Norway, he's considered to be one of the most famous, if not the most famous person the country has ever produced. He kind of made his international reputation at age 31 when he organized and led an expedition to the North Pole. This expedition didn't make it all the way to the North Pole, but it broke the previous record by about 150 miles. And equally important, he brought everybody back on his crew alive uh, to tell their, their story. Most of these Polar expeditions in those days ended in disaster. Then in his 40s, Fritjof Nansen became a statesman. He helped Norway achieve its independence from Norway. Norway uh, and Sweden were joined up until 1905. And when they separated, Norway wanted to have a new king. They were comfortable with the form of constitutional monarchy. And so the powers that be identified a, a prince in Denmark, who they thought might make a good king for Norway. And they sent Fritjof Nansen to Denmark to convince this prince to give up his life in Denmark and take on the crown of the, as king of Norway. And Fritjof Nansen was very persuasive, and this gentleman agreed and became the King Haakon VII of Norway in 1905. And then in uh, his uh, 60s, Fritjof Nansen became a humanitarian. After World War I ends, the newly formed League of Nations appoints him the first high commissioner for refugees. And he does such a good job for the League of Nations in a, a variety of tasks as the high commissioner of refugees that he's awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1922. So I tell people this one man in his lifetime accomplished as much as Lewis and Clark, Abraham Lincoln, and Martin Luther King, you know, explorer, statesman, humanitarian. But that's a tall order to be living in a country and have a father like that in Norway, which at the time had a population of only about three and a half million people, you know, you're only going to be known by the the uh, notoriety of and and uh, renown of your father. So just to kind of go over the basic dates, as I mentioned, Nansen is born in 1901, December 6th. In 1927, he marries his sweetheart, a woman named Kadi Hirsch. He also graduates in 1927 from his college in Norway with a degree in architecture because like an artistic person, uh, kind of a good calling for him. And once he has this kind of architectural degree and his marriage license in hand, he immediately ups and leaves Norway, and moves to New York City, he lives in Brooklyn, New York, works as an architect in New York City, very successful, wins an architectural prize when he's 29 years old. And I think he probably went to New York for various reasons, but certainly one of the reasons, I think, was he just wanted to get out from under his father's shadow. He wanted to go to a place where he had to kind of make it on his own merits and not always be known simply as the son of Fritjof Nansen. Well, in 1930, he gets word that Fritjof is ill. He's got a heart ailment. In those days, they had no medicines for heart ailments. They had no surgeries for heart ailments. The only uh, recipe was pretty much rest. And even though Fritjof Nansen was resting, he wasn't getting any better. In fact, he was slowly declining in health. So Nansen returns to Norway, takes his family back to Norway, and they arrive in time to say their goodbyes to Fritjof Nansen 
who dies in May of 1930, at which point Ann Nansen decides that he doesn't need to go back to the United States. He can stay in Norway. And again, I think it's because this person who would always kind of overshadow him isn't there anymore. He doesn't have to compete with his father. And I think if we could go back in a time machine and interview Ann Nansen in 1930 and ask him how he sees his life unfolding, I think he would have said something along the lines of, well, gosh, everything looks great to me. Everything looks rosy. My future looks bright. I had some great work experience in the United States, and I now want to open my own, my own architectural firm here in Norway, which he ended up doing. I had my first child in Brooklyn. I want to have more children, grow my family, which he ended up doing. And I'm now living and working with all my former neighbors and classmates. Everything looks great. But of course, we know that the storm clouds are already beginning to form over Europe. January 1933, Hitler is appointed Chancellor of Germany. He almost immediately starts persecuting the Jews. Many of them flee to Austria. Germany annexes Austria in March 1938. Many of those Jewish refugees move to Czechoslovakia. In fact, young Tommy Bergenthal was born in Czechoslovakia of parents who had moved from Germany to Czechoslovakia, figuring we'll live here until this madness in Germany with Hitler blows over, and then, of course, we'll move back. And, of course, we know how all that turned out. So you have this refugee problem throughout all of Central Europe. You've got all these stateless refugees, primarily but not exclusively Jewish, who have nowhere to go and no ability to move across country borders because they don't have valid passports. In order to have a valid passport, you have to be a citizen of a country. And under the Nuremberg laws, all the Jews have been denaturalized. They're officially stateless. So a number of prominent Norwegians come to Nansen and say, something has got to be done about these refugees. We've got to help them somehow. And we've all concluded that the person who, who can organize this best is you. So Ann Nansen is now being asked to kind of give, put his career on hold, put his family on hold, and throw himself into this. But as, as one of his contemporaries said, he was mindful of the fact that he was the bearer of the Nansen name. And that was a very, very famous name in Norway. He knew he could probably open doors that other people couldn't. So he forms this organization, Nansen Yelpen, meaning Nansen Relief, to help these refugees get visas to come to Norway. And it's an uphill battle because the governments of Norway and all the Western powers, Great Britain, France, United States, were all anti very, very anti-Semitic at the time. They were very um, concerned about the treatment of the Jews in Europe um, by Hitler, but they were not prepared to change their immigration laws or regulations to allow more of these Jewish refugees to come into this country. So Nansen really has to bang his head against the wall just to make any progress. And by the time the war breaks out, in January 19, and I'm sorry, it's September 1939, he's been successful in bringing almost about 300 men, women, and children into Norway, at which point he has to shut down Nansen Yelpen. Well, fast forward about eight more months after that into the spring of 1940, Germany invades Norway. And one of the reasons why they invaded Norway was basically to prevent the British from occupying Norway. They were afraid if the British occupied Norway, that would uh, hamper their ability to wage war in Europe. So they occupied Norway first. Fast forward almost two years after that uh, to January 13th, 1942, and Nansen ends up being arrested. But before we talk about why Nansen was, was arrested, let's just kind of recap what we know about Ad Nansen. Number one, we know he's famous. He's the bearer of the Nansen name. It's famous in Norway even to this day. He's educated. He's got a college degree in the 1920s. Most people didn't go to college in those days. He's a humanitarian, much like his father, forms his organization called Nansen Yelpen. He's also very artistic. We're going to see some, some of his sketches, and you'll see his art, artistry. And Nansen also had a pretty wicked sense of humor. And to talk about a sense of humor, which comes through in his diary, while you're talking about a diary written in a concentration camp, almost sounds a little bit oxymoronic. Like, how could that possibly be? But I think Nansen used humor as a way of coping with the horrors that he was describing. Some of you out there in the audience may be familiar with a man named Viktor Frankl. He wrote a book after the war called Man's Search for Meaning. And in that book, Frankl says, 
Humor was another of the soul's weapons in the fight for self-preservation. So let me give you a couple of examples of, of nonsense humor. This first example, I guess more accurately, we would call it his wit. But his wit is so dry and so subtle that I think if you read his diary too quickly, too literally, too matter-of-factly, you're almost liable to miss the point he's making. So this first diary entry is from Friday, January 16th, 1942. That's only three days after he's been arrested. He's talking about getting his prison uniform issued to him. He writes, Trousers and jacket, a shirt, and a pair of boots were issued to us today by Henning Botker, who was in charge of the wardrobe. The jacket, the shirt, and the trousers were too small for me and the boots unwearable. Everything else was all right. Or here's another case, one of my, in fact, one of my favorite diary entries in this whole book. This is from the summer of June of 1944. Nonsense now in Sachsenhausen, and he's talking about the work squad that he works in. They called their work squads commandos. That was the word they gave him. And Nonsense is talking about the SS officer who is standing in his uh, work squad, keeping an eye on the prisoners. He writes, the Unterscharfuhrer in this commando, and an Unterscharfuhrer would be the equivalent of a sergeant, who shares my cubicle all day, thinks exclusively and all the time, of girls and unfaithfulness. Last night, one of his wenches wrote on his cigarette case the words, I love you, but in English. Of course, he had no idea what they meant, so he asked me this morning. I told them they meant, kiss my arse. His jaw dropped notably, and I let it drop. So why was Nansen arrested? Well, we have to back up from January 13th, 1942, about three weeks to Boxing Day 1941, Boxing Day being the day after Christmas. On that day, the British Special Forces, British commandos, along with some Norwegian soldiers, um, instituted a series of raids along the coastline of Norway. They quickly land and blow up a number of factories that the Germans have converted into military use. In the process, they end up... Um, killing a number of German soldiers who are guarding these factories. They also capture a number of German, uh, of Norwegian fascists, these Quislings, to take back to, to England. And surprisingly, a number, a number of Norwegians approach these forces and say, let, come, let me, take me back to Great Britain with you. I want to join the, the British forces, whether it's the Navy, the, the Air Force, whatever, so I can fight against the Norwegian, uh, fight against the uh, Germans in Norway. And of course, this is a major embarrassment to the man who is in charge of Norway, the personal representative of Hitler. His name is Joseph Turboven. And what he decides to do in response to this, to prevent these kind of embarrassing raids from continuing, is he orders the arrest of 20 of the most prominent citizens in the country as hostages. He doesn't charge them with doing anything wrong. Nonsense never accused of doing anything wrong. He was, in fact, in the resistance, but the Germans never knew that and never found out about that. But he was prominent, and they wanted really prominent people. The more prominent you are, the, the more valuable you are as a hostage. And they're put in prison, and they're told, you're just going to stay there until we feel like letting you out. You're basically a bargaining chip or an insurance policy at this point. So that's why Nansen is arrested. So why did Nansen write a diary? Well, first of all, just to observe what's uh, obvious, keeping a diary in a concentration camp is one heck of a dangerous undertaking. You can easily be executed for, for something far less than, than that. And in fact, Nansen mentions in his diary about how a Dutch prisoner is caught red-handed with his diary, and he's hauled away and no one ever sees him alive again. But Nansen had been keeping a diary pretty much his entire life, ever since he was a teenager. I've seen his journals going all the way back to his teenage years with all sorts of doodles in the margins. So this was kind of a habit that he had been in for years and years and years. And Nansen writes in his own introduction to the diary that he published, he says, I never wrote this with the intent of publishing it. It, it, it never even occurred to me at the time to be writing this for, uh, for publication. He says, I really wrote it for two primary reasons. He said, the first reason is basically for my own mental well-being. He says, writing in the diary was, quote, like confiding in a close friend and relieving my mind of all that weighed on it. 
it became a private manner of forgetting. So I think if Nansen could write things down, then he didn't have to keep mentally revisiting them all the time. He could kind of put it away. It's kind of like when you write your grocery list. Then you put it out of your mind. You don't keep thinking about it. And he said, the other reason why I wrote the diary was for my wife, Cotty. I wanted her to know what was really going on in these camps that I was in, various camps in both Norway and then later on in Germany. For about 18 months, Nansen was in prisons in Norway, first just outside of Oslo, then a camp above the Arctic Circle. Then he was returned to this camp outside of Oslo called Ganini. Then he got in trouble with the commandant, and the commandant, to punish him, sends him off to Sachsenhausen in the fall of 1943. Now, Nansen could write letters to his wife that went through the 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 prison system, and excuse me, and she could write letters that she could deliver to the camp authorities, and they would deliver to him. But all those letters going in and out were censored. They were writ they were read by the Germans. They wanted to make sure that the prisoners weren't scheming, they weren't bad mouthing the Germans, they weren't uh, conspiring to do something. So, what can you say in a letter when you know it's going to be read by the Germans? Now, occasionally, Nansen's wife, while he was out in Ganini, just outside of Oslo, she could get permission to visit him. And here's Nansen's sketch of a visit. You can see she's there with their family, the kids. He's behind the barrier. But standing as close to uh, Nansen as his own wife is, is a guard who is fluent in Norwegian, who's listening to the entire conversation, which was limited to only about 10 or 15 minutes. So again, what can you possibly say to your spouse that's meaningful in a situation like that? So Nansen used his diary as a way of telling his wife what was really going on in this camp. In fact, many of his diary entries begin with the words, Dear Kari, listen to what happened today. And many of his diary entries end with the words, Good night, Kari. It's almost like he's conversing with her while he's pouring out everything, his soul on everything that went on. And as you can imagine, Nansen spends an awful lot of his time obsessing about his wife. He thinks about her all the time, worries about her. He finds out after he's been arrested that she's pregnant with their fourth child. So he's worrying about her pregnancy, how she's going to do managing the household without him. So let me share with you a couple of diary entries about his wife. This first one is from May 23rd, 1942, a Saturday. And when Nansen was writing this diary entry, he was in solitary confinement. He was being punished by the Germans because they caught him writing a poem that they considered to be anti-German because the subject of the poem was freedom. And he writes, I wonder where Kati is today. Is she sitting alone as well? She may be unhappy for my sake. She must have heard by now that I'm inside, meaning he's in solitary. But dear Kari, soon all these horrors will be over. We shall live together again and be happy. I can't do anything without you, not even be in prison. Now, when he writes those hopeful words, soon we'll be together, soon we'll be happy, soon these horrors will be over. He's been in prison for all of three months. What he doesn't know, but of course we know in retrospect, is it's going to take another three years before he's finally liberated and reunited with his wife. So compare the hopeful tone of that diary entry with another one that he writes in, uh, in 1944, two years later, August 27th, which just so happens to be the day of their wedding anniversary. And he writes, today is our wedding day, 17 years, the third wedding day in prison. So in a way that only makes 14, but 14 bright, rich years that have made it possible for me to get through these three dark ones. The will that has given us these 17 years, no one can take from us. It is of eternity and will never die, even though we should never meet again. So you can see the nonsense beginning to contemplate. He may never get out of these camps alive. The war seems to go on indefinitely. He thought the war was going to end in 43, 44. Here it is, August of 44, and it's going on with increased intensity with no end in sight. And the longer you stay in a concentration camp, the greater the chances of something bad happening to you. Guard takes a dislike to you and shoots you. Wouldn't even have to explain it or justify it. You could easily catch one of the infectious diseases that are rampant in these camps like typhus, typhoid fever, dysentery, any one of which can easily kill you. So you can see how much more somber he is there. So those are the three, those are the two stated reasons that Nansen mentions for his, his motivation to keep the diary. 
But I think if you read between the lines, at least this is my, my reading, is that a third reason kind of intruded on him. And even though it wasn't an initial motivation to keep the diary, I think it became an important motivation to keep writing the diary, even though he knew how dangerous he, the danger he was entering by doing this on a continuous basis. And that is that Nansen began to realize that he was an eyewitness to the Holocaust as it was unfolding in real time. And that his diary could be a first person eyewitness account to this. And Nansen writes in his diary, he says, I'm not even sure people will believe what I'm writing in this diary. It is so unbelievably horrifying that people won't even believe it after the war, assuming they get to read all this. And so I think Nansen had a motivation to record the stories of prisoners and, and describe what was going on in both words and in images. Here's another one of his drawings. This one, in fact, you can see his own handwriting on the bottom of it. On the lower left, it says, on Musselman, on the right-hand side, Sachsenhausen, November 1944. And certainly this image of a prisoner is something I think we can, we've, we've all kind of conjured up in my, our minds of what a, a uh, image of a skeletal uh, concentration camp prisoner is like. And the term Musselman is a Norwegian term that means Muslim. And for reasons that no one's sure of, even to this day, the term Musulman was given to almost all the prisoners in these different concentration camps who were so emaciated, so weakened, so enervated, so without hope that their lifespan was measured in days, if not in hours. And of course, who made up the majority of the Musulman in these camps? It was the Jews. The Jews had the worst of everybody, of, of anything. Now, they weren't the only people who were brutalized in these camps, the Poles, the Russians, and interestingly, even more, the Ukrainians were all brutalized by the Germans in these camps. Because in that pecking order that I mentioned before, the Germans put the East European Slavic races really just one notch above the Jews. But as Elie Wiesel reminds us, although not all victims were Jews, all Jews were victims. And that's a distinction I think we always have to keep in mind. And whereas almost all the other prisoners in these concentration camps would, would treat Jewish prisoners as pariahs, people you wanted to stay as far away from as possible because nothing good could come to you from associating with a Jewish prisoner. If you wanted to get caught in a random beating, you had to go ahead and hang out with the Jewish prisoners. But, and as a result, most people would stay away from them. But Nansen would in fact go to the Jewish barracks. He would meet with these prisoners. He would ask them questions. Tell me what other camps were you in? What were the conditions like in those camps? Uh, what did you do before the war? Tell me about your family life. And many of these Jewish prisoners would say to him, we know we're never going to get out of these camps alive. We know that much. So somebody has to tell our stories for us. And so I think Nansen used his diary to tell these stories. And he talks about a Jewish builder, for instance, from Budapest that he befriends. And this man explains to him how he's captured in Yugoslavia and marched from Yugoslavia all the way to Sachsenhausen. That's a march of 500 miles. Starts out with a column of 3,000 men, ends up with 850 barely walking into Sachsenhausen alive. And this is what Nansen writes about this Jewish builder in one of his diary entries. The date of it is Monday, December 18th, 1944. And he writes... There is one touching detail I must relate about this man. I've given him a few clothes and some cigarettes and some food. He was very anxious to show his gratitude. One day he came to me with a little thing that he wanted to give me as a souvenir, and I had to promise to keep it. It was, he said, the very best thing he owned. He had nothing else. It was one of the cigarettes that he had borrowed from me, now neatly wrapped up in silver paper. I had given him only three cigarettes that time. I was in rather low water myself. After the war, he added, he would give me the same present in gold and in precious stones. Now, why would anybody make such an extravagant offer? Gold, precious stones? I'm sure this man was grateful for the food that Nansen gave and the tobacco and the clothing. But I think this man was kind of going over and above 
to show his gratitude for something that might have been even more important to him, even if it was more intangible. And that was the gift of friendship, you know, the gift of empathy, the gift of just simply listening. Almost every other prisoner is saying, look, don't tell me your sob story. I got enough problems on my own. But Nansen wasn't like that. He was outer directed. He wanted to get involved in these people's lives. So finally, how did Nansen preserve this diary, given how dangerous it was? Well, of course, the first challenge was simply writing the diary. Nansen was one of these people, much apparently like his father, who had this incredible ability to operate on almost no sleep. So whereas almost all the other prisoners would be sound asleep, exhausted by 9 or 10 o'clock at night, Nansen would stay up till 11, 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning writing his diary, then go to bed at 2 o'clock and get up at 4.30 and go back to work. And the second challenge that Nansen had was then hiding the pages of the diary as he was writing them. And Nansen says, I put them in the one place I knew the Germans would never go look for them. And that was in the latrine. The Germans stayed clear of the latrine. To them, that was just a source of infectious bacteria that was just going to lead to disease. And the Germans were germaphobes. They were definitely afraid of getting all of these camp diseases. So he knew his pages of his diary were safe there. So then the real challenge, third challenge, was smuggling the pages of the diary out of the camp. Well, as I mentioned, Nansen was in prison in different places in Norway for about 18 months. And the only people coming in and out of that, those prisons to deliver food, building supplies, do repairs, basically every civilian contact with these camps was being handled by Norwegian civilians who were passing in and out. And these civilians who were coming into the camp, they, ha they would happen to be the neighbors, the in-laws, the friends, the co-workers of the prisoners who were behind the, the barbed wire. So they were all more than willing to smuggle things out of the camp. And they had all sorts of ingenious methods of smuggling things out. False bottoms in matchbooks, hollowed out crate, uh, fish crates. Uh, in my research, one of my trips to, uh, to Norway, Nansen's family showed me a letter that he wrote on a piece of paper that's one inch wide and about 12 or 13 inches long, which he then rolled up into a cigarette. In those days, you rolled your own cigarettes. You didn't buy cigarette packs like we do. So Nansen, and of course, some worker would come in and say, hey, buddy, can I, you know, a cigarette I can borrow? Sure, take this one. Knowing full well that he wasn't going to smoke it, he would bring it back to, to Nansen's wife. But when Nansen gets to Germany in October of 1943, he writes in his diary, he says, I don't know how I'm ever going to get this diary out of Germany. There's nobody outside the wire who is going to risk their lives to help me smuggle this out. But psychologically, for all the reasons that I've mentioned before, that I have to keep writing this for my own sanity. I'm just going to keep going, hoping that I can think of some solution. And if I can't think of any solution, uh, assuming I ever get out of this camp alive, I will bury the whole diary in the ground, I guess, presumably with the thought that he would then try to come back after the war and maybe retrieve it. And diaries have been found buried in the ground at different concentration camps, primarily in Auschwitz. So people, other prisoners, much like him, had the same thought process. But Nansen says, I realized at one point that even though I and all my fellow prisoners, when we left the prison or when we left the, the concentration camp in the morning to go to our workstations, Sachsenhausen was so crowded with prisoners that there was literally no space for them to do any work. They had to leave the prison to go to these various work sites scattered all around Sachsenhausen. And he says, when we left, we were searched. When we, when we came back into the camp, we were searched. And it became apparent that what the Germans were mostly worried about were weapons. They were worried about prisoners getting their hands on any kind of weapons, whether it was knives, guns, hand grenades, explosives, stockpiling them in the camp, then staging an uprising. And there had been a prisoner uprising in, in Sachsenhausen, I'm sorry, in uh, Auschwitz in the fall of 1944. There was one in Sobibor. There was one in Treblinka. So this was a very real concern on the part of the, the German guards. And Nansen says, I realized that the Germans didn't pay a whole lot of attention to the things that we prisoners would carry around with us. And one of the things we'd carry with us, if we could get our hands on it, was a piece of wood, roughly about this size, maybe four by six, five by seven. And they called this their breadboard. And in the morning, you'd line up in your barracks, you'd hold down your breadboard, and the head of your barracks would put your daily ration of bread on this. You get half a loaf of black bread. And that's, that was it for the day in terms of your bread ration. So what you did with it after that was up to you. 
So these, these are kind of like your personal work surface for these prisoners. Since it was just a block of wood and not very threatening, the Germans really didn't pay attention to it. And Nancy says, I finally realized that I could take my breadboard, go to one of my friends who worked in the carpentry commando, who had access to some carpentry tools, and split open my breadboard, hollow out the inside of it, and I put the pages of my diary inside this hollowed out portion. And then when it was full, glue it back together, and no one would be any worse for the wiser. And at the end of the war, Nansen and five of his closest friends all walked out of the camps with their breadboards. Nobody even took a look at them. And in that way, they smuggled out the entire German portion of his diary. And here's a picture of a real breadboard. This is not Nansen's. Nansen's is on permanent display in Norway's World War II Museum. This is one of his friends. But you can see, especially the image on the right-hand side there, that the paper he was writing on was like tissue paper, ultra, ultra thin. You could pack a lot of pages into a relatively small cavity. What's also not completely apparent, but I think you get the idea from this, is that Nazi's handwriting was microscopically small, such that when the typist had to look at these pages to turn it into a, micro, into a manuscript back in 1947, they needed magnifying glasses just to read his handwriting. So we've talked a little bit about kind of the who, what, where, when of Donson, why he was arrested, why he wrote the diary, how he preserved it. In the course of that, we've talked a little bit about his sense of humor, about his love for his wife, Cotty, his sympathy for the plight of the Jews. But to me, the, the ultimate power of this diary, the reason why I spent six years of my life trying to get this thing published and then the last eight years of my life giving talks like this to audiences much like you is the power I find of nonsense example. The example of a man who somehow manages to hold on to his humanity in the most inhumane conditions mankind has ever conceived of. You know, Nansen could have walked right by Tom Bergenthal, could have ignored him like every other person ignored Tom Bergenthal, could have justified it, could have rationalized it and said, there's no way this kid's going to survive. Why should I get involved? The chances of him making it through the war are practically nil, given his condition. But Nansen didn't do that. He intervened and he saved Tommy. And since I began my talk tonight telling you the story of how Tommy ended up in Sachsenhausen, let me come full circle, telling me, tell you what ultimately became of him. He survived to the end of the war. He was liberated in April 1945. His mother, who had been transported from uh, Auschwitz to a woman's camp in Germany called Ravensbrück, she survived to the end of the war. His father, who was transported from Sachsen from uh, Auschwitz, rather, first to Sachsenhausen, actually, for a week or two, and then on to a subcamp of Buchenwald called Ordruf, died. He did not survive. He died of pneumonia in January 1945, just weeks before it was liberated. And it would take Tommy and his mother a year and a half after the war ends, until not until December of 1946 that they finally reunited. And you have to remember, until Tommy was liberated in the spring of 1945, and for some period of time after that, he's basically completely illiterate. Tommy has never been in a school in his entire life. He has been a prisoner of the Nazis since he was five years old in 1939. And when Nansen asks him why his parents didn't teach him how to read and write, he explains to uh, uh, Nansen, that if his parents were caught teaching him how to read and write, they could have been shot. That was a capital crime in the Kelsey ghetto where he lived with his parents. So this kid's got essentially no background, no in, uh, schooling at all. And so when his mother reunites with him, she takes him back to Germany, which is where she had grown up, and she hires a tutor. She says to the tutor, I want you to teach my son in 12 months everything that he should learn in grades one through seven. So at the end of that 12 months, I can enroll him in the eighth grade, which is the grade he would have been in, should have been in if he was a normal German uh, child. And so Tommy has a year of tutoring. Then he enters the ninth, eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, starts the 11th grade. Now he's a young teenager starting to think about his own life, his career, his future. And he decides he doesn't want to live in Germany for reasons that I think are pretty, pretty clear. And he has an aunt and uncle who live in Patterson, New Jersey. So he decides to emigrate to the United States. So here's a kid. He arrives in January of 1952, I believe. Now here's somebody, just think about this. 
who's had three and a half years of any formal education at all, three and a half years in any classroom, three and a half years of any English instruction. He's now showing up in a foreign country that he's never seen before. He's living with an aunt and uncle he's never met before. He's arriving in the middle of an academic year as a junior in high school. Well, he finishes high school there at Patterson East High. He gets a scholarship to a small liberal arts college in West Virginia. Four years later, he graduates as the valedictorian of his class. He then goes on to NYU Law School, gets a legal degree. From NYU, he goes on to Harvard Law School, and he gets a master's degree and a doctorate in the field of international law and human rights, a field he says he was motivated to follow by the example of odd nonsense. And Tom Bergenthal goes on to win every accolade, every award in the field of human rights that you can imagine. And that career culminated in the year 2000, when Tom Bergenthal was appointed a justice to the International Court of Justice at The Hague. And that's a picture of Tom Bergenthal in his judicial robes. Now, one of the most unexpected benefits of my decision way back in 2010 to get this diary of odd nonsense back into print was that in the course of doing that, I became a very close friend of Tom Bergenthal's. Wonderful, wonderful man. Unfortunately, he passed away last May, May 29th. He had just turned 89 years old. He died of complications of COVID, even though, of course, he was vaxxed and uh, boosted. But at age 89, he was already in frail health and he passed away. But a most, most remarkable man. And the new version of Nonsense Diary, the one that, that I edited, when Nansen published it way back in 1947, he dedicated this diary to a number of Norwegians who were murdered in these different concentration camps for his friends. But there, he also dedicated the book, he says, to you, to you too, little Tommy, to your living memory, I dedicate this book. Now, as a favor, I think, to Nansen and as a favor to me, when this book was republished in 20. Uh, 16, uh, Tom Bergenthal wrote a new preface for it. That's a preface written 71 years after the fact that that book was dedicated to him as a young child after in, in post-war Europe. To me, you can't make up facts that are as, as amazing as that. So what I'd like to do is wrap up by reading you or leaving you with one final diary entry, which to me kind of sums up emotionally, at least, this whole story. The date of it is March 5th, 1945. And Nansen learns that he's about to be moved to yet another concentration camp, a camp called Neuengamme, located outside of Hamburg. And he goes to Tommy and he says, Tommy, this is the hardest news, the hardest thing I've had to do as my three and a half years as a prisoner. And that's to say goodbye to you. I have to leave you because I'm going to be transported. And I've thought of every way of taking you with me. but That's impossible. So you have to promise me, please, please, that you'll write to me after the war and tell me how you made out. And Tommy apparently responded by saying, yes, uh, of course, I'd be happy to do that. After all, I consider it to be my duty. And Nansen is so struck by the fact that this 10-year-old boy is, is telling him what his duty is, that he writes this diary entry about this, this uh, dialogue that he's, he has with Tom Bergenthal. And when I'm reading this, just remember, when Nansen writes this diary entry, he doesn't know the war, when the war is going to end. In fact, it's going to end in eight weeks, but he has long since given up wondering. It just seems like the war is going to go on forever. It just never seems to end. He doesn't know whether this camp, the Noyangama, that he's going to be sent to is better or worse than the camp he's already in. When he gets to Noyangama, he says, if death stalked the streets of Sachsenhausen, it galloped in Noyangama. He doesn't know whether the supply of Red Cross food parcels will continue. By now, the Allies are bombing everything that moves. And yet, with all of that weighing on him, just listen to how he writes this diary entry. How eloquent it is, how compassionate it is, how hopeful it is. And knowing what we know about Tom's stellar career, which, of course, Nazim couldn't possibly have a clue of back in, in um, 19, March of 1945, just imagine how unbelievably prophetic these words are. So this is what he writes. Little Tommy, if only your fellow creatures thought a fraction as much about their duty to you as you do about yours to them. Thank God you don't realize that. Uh, I'm sorry. 
if, if only your fellow creatures thought a fraction as much about the duty to you as you do about yours to them, all your prospects would be brighter than they are today. Thank God you don't realize that. And may you never come to realize the abyss of vile injustice that has been done to you. May there be such a future in store for you that all this frightful, this unintelligible cruelty be expunged from your mind. May you discover that life is not like that. The world is not as it looked to you from the floor of a cattle car when you cried because you were so terribly cold. May you one day grasp and experience its richness and all the warmth and joy, all the beaming light that are reflected in those big eyes of yours, too shrewd for a child's and which are a reminder and evidence of what you were meant to be. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Tim. That was very captivating presentation. We really appreciate it that you took the time this evening to talk to us about Ott Nansen, Thomas Bergenthal, and this amazing masterpiece of a diary which you helped to bring back to our attention. I think at this point, I'm going to stop the recording so people okay. can feel free to come forward with their questions. So thank you again. I will stop the recording now and everybody please unmute yourself or send us a question in the chat. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Elizabeth.